Bibles now and turn with me, if you will, over to Exodus chapter 3. I'm going to read the passage in Exodus chapter 3, verses 7 through 15. Exodus chapter 3, verses 7 through 15. Because here we hear about eternal memorials. And the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people which are in Egypt, and have heard their cry by reason of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrows, and I am come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians, and to bring them up out of the land into a good land and large, unto a land flowing with milk and honey, unto the place of the Canaanites and the Hivites and the Amorites and the Perizzites and the Hivites and the Jebusites. Now therefore, Behold, the cry of the children of Israel is come unto me, and I have also seen the oppression wherewith the Egyptians oppress them. Come now, therefore, I will send thee unto Pharaoh, that thou mayest bring forth my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. And Moses said unto God, Who am I, that I should go unto Pharaoh, and that I should bring forth the children of Israel out of Egypt? And he said, Certainly, I will be with thee, and this shall be a token unto thee that I have sent thee. When thou hast brought forth the people out of Egypt, and ye shall serve God upon this mountain. And Moses said unto God, Behold, when I come to the children of Israel, and shall say unto them, The God of your fathers hath sent me unto you, and they shall say unto me, what is his name? What shall I say unto them? Remember, Israel's been in Egypt for 430 years at this point, and they have many, many, many gods with many different names. And they say, well, but, but we don't even remember the name of the God of our forefathers. When they say unto me, what is his name? What shall I say unto them? And God said unto Moses, I am that I am. And Jesus claimed that name for himself in John chapter 8. And he said, Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, I am hath sent me unto you. And God said moreover unto Moses, this is our key verse, Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, The Lord, that's Jehovah, Yahweh, all capitals, The Lord God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, hath sent me unto you. Now get this last phrase. This is my name forever, and this is my memorial unto all generations. Gracious Father, we thank you once again for your word and for its power. And we stand in awe at your holy name, which you would have remembered from generation to generation, an eternal memorial for you alone, our God. We pause in wonder and awe, for you are our God. Our scripture today was from Exodus 3, 7 through 15. God's name is the eternal memorial that he has given to us. God is a book of remembrance. God engraved his law on stone. God has given us a mind to remember deeds that we have done and deeds that he has done and deeds that other people have done. But his name represents all that he is, all that he is doing, all that in his eternal decrees he has promised to do. 
Today I also want to tie that passage in to Proverbs chapter 10, verses 6 and 7. Again, another memorial here. Blessings are upon the head of the just, but the violence covereth the mouth of the wicked. The memory of the just is blessed, but the name of the wicked shall rot. Each morning between 4.30 and 6 a.m., I listen to the news. This morning as I was getting dressed, they interviewed, perhaps from a recording many years before, they interviewed the last living soldier from World War I. He mentioned fighting in Flanders. Suddenly, my memory was flooded with a poem that I memorized 55 or 60 years ago. I memorized it way back in high school. In fact, I was astounded that I could even remember it. But it came back clearly and with the same powerful impact that it made on me those many, many years ago. I think it's a fitting introduction to our Memorial Day Sunday when we remember those brave men and women who gave their all to make us a free nation. In Flandersfield, the poppies blow between the crosses, row on row, that mark our place. While in the sky, the larks still bravely singing fly, scarce heard amidst the guns below. We are the dead. Short days ago, we lived, felt dawn, saw sunset low, loved, and were loved. Now we lie in Flanders Field. Take up our quarrel with the foe. To you, from failing hands, we throw the torch. Be yours to hold you all. If ye break faith with us who die, we shall not sleep though poppies blow in Flanders Field. This is Memorial Day Sunday. The torch has been thrown to us. This is a day in which we remember our brave troops all the way back to the days that America became a nation. Faithful men and women who have fought for our freedom. In particular, so that we might have freedom to worship God without government interference. Let me publicly say thank you to those who have made the ultimate sacrifice and have laid down their lives on the altar of freedom. Throughout the history of the world, totalitarian governments have tried to play God. They view themselves as having the position and the absolute authority of God. As a result, they want no competition from the true God, the God of heaven, for the hearts and the minds of men. Unregenerate men hate the true God. Unregenerate men will do anything they can to keep the true God from being worshipped. Unregenerate men will oppress and kill those who hold a higher allegiance than to their petty human governments. Even today there's a horrible struggle going on in so-called Christian America where Satan's silly, depraved, left-wing little human munchkins, his petty pawns, try to stop all public expression of Christian ethics, morals, and principles in the public venue. They do not want to have, or for you to have, freedom of speech, 
or freedom of the press, or freedom of conscience, or freedom of religion. Eventually, they do not want you to even have these freedoms in private. In other words, they don't want you to be free at all. You have two bulletin inserts in your bulletin today on that subject, as well as other materials. I hope you read them. The one entitled Price of Freedom lays out the first three essentials. Number one, freedom is a gift from God. By the way, that was even admitted by Thomas Jefferson, who wrote, God who gave us life gave us liberty at the same time, unquote. Freedom is not the gift of government. Even Jefferson, whom the liberals and the left wings and the atheists quote all the time, Jefferson himself said, God who gave us life gave us liberty at the same time. Number two, Jesus made it clear that freedom is a gift of love. Greater love has no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friend. Number three, this should be self-evident, but I'll say it anyway. Freedom requires sacrifice and warfare. We're in a great spiritual war with the enemy of our souls who wants to steal our freedom in Christ. But you must fight the battle and win. The second insert that you have in your bulletin today is entitled, is euthanasia a biblical solution to terminal illness or suffering? And then on the back of those two news clippings that I mentioned a few minutes ago. But the article on euthanasia is very appropriate for this Sunday. It makes it clear that life, like freedom, is a gift from God. Life, like freedom, is a gift of love. And life, like freedom, requires sacrifice and warfare in our struggle against the enemies, death and Satan. Life must never be treated cheaply or as merely an economic commodity or a burden for the caregivers. That sets the stage for four foundational principles, biblical principles. Number one, freedom cannot exist without biblical morality. You can't have it. It's impossible to have true freedom without biblical morality because sin puts you in slavery. When you're hooked on drugs, you're not free. When you're hooked on sex, you're not free. When you're hooked on porn, you're not free. When you're hooked on anything else, you're not free. Biblical morality is essential to freedom. Number two, Ignorance and freedom are mutually exclusive. Ignorance and freedom are mutually exclusive. If you don't know what's going on, very soon someone will take control and you won't even know it until it's too late. Our primaries are coming up on June 5th. Just about 10 days from now, nine days, New Jersey primaries. Everybody age 18 and over ought to vote. If you're not registered to vote, shame on you. If you don't vote in the primaries, you don't have a choice in the general election as to who is running. You need to vote. That's one of the blessings that our country has been given that many people in the world do not have. Number three, not merely our freedom, but our inalienable rights come from God and not from government. Our inalienable rights come from God, not man, not from government. And number four, the essence of national freedom is the strict limitation of government. Not getting government bigger and bigger, but getting it smaller and smaller and smaller until it is the most effective thing that does good for the people, not money for the pockets of the politicians. This is Memorial Day Sunday, and so it's a day of remembrance. 
Proverbs chapter 10, verses 6 and 7 that we read just a moment ago gave us an excellent summary of a memory that is honored and a memory that is not honored. Those are parallel verses, and each tells us something about the just, and each verse tells us something about the wicked. Blessings are upon the head of the just, but violence covers the mouth of the wicked. The memory of the just is blessed, but the name of the wicked shall rot. In both verses, blessing is attached to the just, that is, the righteous man. In the first instance, the blessing is upon the head of the just. In other words, the blessing is a current state of being, like a crown that has been placed with honor on one who is alive. But in the second verse, we find the just, or the righteous person, is no longer present. He's died, or at least he's not able to receive the honor for the standards that he has held. The righteous man will have God's present blessing, whether or not the world likes it. But we find that in the second verse, his memory is blessed. We see how the righteous person is remembered by people. The people who receive godly input from the righteous man or the woman in the past, that produces a blessed memory. Every time those who are left behind remember the righteous person, it brings praise, it brings thanksgiving. Their memory is a source of joy, strength, and motivation to godly service. Their memory is an encouragement to be more faithful, more diligent, more heavenly minded. When we remember these folks, it doesn't bring pain or hatred or horror or depression. Their memory is blessed. We hear a lot about legacy building today. Presidents want to leave a legacy of something they've done. May I suggest to you that the true legacy is in righteousness so that you as a just man or woman or boy or girl, your memory will be blessed. You look at the contrast with the wicked who are mentioned in both verses as well. The first verse talks about the mouth of the wicked. The second verse talks about the name of the wicked. Jesus explained to us that the mouth is the principal means by which the wicked heart is revealed. In Matthew 15, 18, but those things which proceed out of the mouth come forth from the heart and they defile the man. For out of the heart proceedeth evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, blasphemies. These are the things which defile the man. James tells us that the mouth is harder to control than the body itself. If any man among you seems to be religious and bridleth not his tongue, but deceiveth his own heart, this man's religion is vain. You can't control your mouth? The Bible says your religion is vain. It's empty. You don't control your mouth? There's no proof that you're a Christian. You can't control your mouth? Your religion is hollow. Has no substance to it. Even so, the tongue is a little member that boasteth great things. Behold, how great a matter a little fire kindleth. And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. So is the tongue among our members that it defileth the whole body, and setteth on fire the course of nature, and it set on fire of hell. But the tongue can no man tame. It is an unruly evil full of deadly poison. Only the Holy Spirit of God can control your tongue. Peter and John tell us the same thing, not merely James. 1 Peter 3.10, For he that will love life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil and his lips that they speak no guile. John writes in 1 John 3.18, My little children, let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. You heard about people who talk it but don't walk it? That's what John's talking about here. In present time, the wicked have a lot to say. They want to be remembered. Their mouth is full of threats and violence, and they think that they'll get, them, get remembered this way. But the second verse tells us how they'll be remembered. Yes, they'll be remembered. The memory of their name will smell like roadkill that sat in the sun for a couple of days. You know, we, we used to see a lot of roadkill in Texas. And I've seen some of it up close. And I've smelled some of it up close. Have you ever smelled a dead animal up close? The name of the wicked shall rot. That's how they'll be remembered. The stench 
to leave behind. It will rot, it will stink in the memory of everyone who thinks about it. You know the names that are blessed in the history of our country? George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, Benjamin Franklin, Patrick Henry, Abraham Lincoln, and others. Those names are blessed. We remember them more than 200 years after they were the instruments that God used to give us this great land and to deliver it in times of war. But you know, there are a lot more that we remember that rot, different characters. Benedict Arnold, who killed Alexander Hamilton in a duel, Nero, the Nazis and their Gestapo, the KGB, Lenin, Stalin, Hitler, Mao Zedong, Castro, Pol Pot, the killing fields of Cambodia. Or how about Julius and Ethel Rosenberg, who sold the U.S. nuclear secrets, top secret radar, sonar, and jet propulsion engines to the Soviet Union at a time when the United States was the only country in the world with the ability to build atomic bombs. And so today we have to worry about a little dictator with a poodle fuzz haircut building a nuclear armory while he talks about denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula, but faking it behind his back. How different the history of the world would be today if those secrets had never gotten out. The Rosenbergs were executed exactly 65 years ago next month on June 19, 1953. All of these names are also remembered, in the United States at least, these names bring anger and repulsion and disgust. As with the righteous, we see the present condition and the identifying marks of the wicked in the first verse, the future and ultimate results earned by the wicked man or the woman in the second verse. The present condition of the wicked heart is revealed by the mouth. It's covered with violence. The Hebrew word for covered is kasa, which means to make plump or to fill up. In the end, the wicked is indeed remembered if he's wicked enough, but the memory of his name stinks like a rotting piece of dead meat that bloats with gas. It's filled up. Poof! Puffy. On Memorial Day, we remember our brave military, many of them Bible-believing Christians and many of them who laid down their lives for our country and the freedoms for which our country has historically stood. They've given their lives both on our own soil and on foreign soil, standing against totalitarian destroyers who have sought to replace the divinely given freedoms that we so much enjoy. The founders of our country understood the responsibility of the Christian to his government far better than most modern American Christians. When was the last time you read the Declaration of Independence? You know it was the unanimous declaration of the 13 United States of America. Can you even quote the opening line. Now, if I read it to you, I know, oh, yes, I remember. But right now, can you bring to mind the opening line of the Declaration of Independence? What is the first word? Anybody? Not we. When? Where in the course of human events it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bands which have connected them with another and to assume among the powers of the earth the separate and equal stations to which the laws of nature, now listen, and of nature's God entitle them, a decent respect to the opinions of mankind requires that they should declare the causes which impel them to the separation. Did you know that it's biblical to believe in separation? Can you read that behind me? It says, be ye separate. 2 Corinthians 6, 17. There are many different causes for separation. Our founders understood the biblical causes. I'll not read you the rest of that, but I wonder when was the last time you read the Declaration of Independence. It should be present patently clear, even to the casual observer, that the framers of the Declaration of Independence were relying on a higher law, a divine law, the law of nature and nature's God. In other words, the Bible, 
to supersede mere human law. Let me say it again. Did you notice the term? Law of nature and nature's God. Our founding fathers were creationists. They understood that there was someone outside of and higher than mere naturalism. One of the essential, the sine qua non elements of freedom is a creator, God, and his creation. That's foundational to freedom. If you believe in evolution, you will not be free. You will soon be brought under bondage because that's survival of the fittest. That has no external standards. That has no reason why government should not reach certain levels of power. The creationist viewpoint is government is boxed in by God's law. It may not do certain things because there is a higher authority than human government. If you remove that, there's no rational basis for saying that the government, also known to some as Big Brother, huh, how can you say that government is not the best solution for solving the problems of the world? Might makes right, survival of the fittest. The educated and elite class should obviously rule the world. Some races are more evolved than other races. There are no absolute rules, no permanent standards, no unchanging truth, no certainty in sexual uh, revelations and uh, uh, absolutes. There's, there's no external standard. There's no reason to resist fiat government declarations. No reason to say that the new standards set by government are just as good with so-called gay marriages and other perversions that are coming out now. No standards at all. When you leave out the creator, the creature can define himself. Satan, of course, understands that and as a result has made a concerted effort to annihilate the teaching of creation in the public schools, the universities, and academia. So, eternal memorials is certainly an appropriate theme for this week as we remember the freedom that God has given to us in the United States. Tomorrow we celebrate Memorial Day. It's with grateful thanksgiving that we, the United States citizens, look back on all those who have sacrificed and fought to give us a truly free nation where we can still worship God. Freedom is a rare commodity in the world today. You know that. Think about North Korea, Russia, Communist China, Saudi Arabia, Syria, Lebanon, Egypt, United Arab Emirates, Cuba, Abu Dhabi, Somalia, Jordan, Lebanon, Burma, Thailand, Indonesia, India, multiple countries in Africa, South America, and around the world. Now think of the United States where Christians are suddenly on the defensive in court as they take stands for the divine standards of being able to speak the truth. Such patently obvious things as men and women are different. That God hates and will judge sodomy and lesbianism and those who practice these perversions. That grown men should not be allowed in the ladies' room with little girls. That teenage boys pretending to be transgendered should not be allowed to take showers with teenage girls. Think of our country where military chaplains are being given dishonorable discharge from the United States military for giving biblical counsel to our armed forces. Where our country's leadership is pushing for the draft of teenage girls to be part of the physical defenders of the country on the front lines and have to bunk with men. Where there was a concerted push by our former president to rip away our Second Amendment rights every time a Muslim terrorist killed people instead of pointing out that it's Islam and its followers who are killing Christians and Jews. What do you think our founding fathers would have done if they had been alive today? Do you think they wrote the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution so that transgendered persons in the military could have sex changes paid for by the taxpayer's dollar? Is that why they wrote the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence? we got to make way for the future wave of transgendered people. That's slavery, folks. That's not freedom. Freedom is truly a rare commodity. And I think it's getting rarer every day here in the United States. The Bible prophesies that there is coming a day in which true freedom will be totally extinguished from the world with the rise of the Antichrist, the mark of the beast, where every human on the planet will be tracked and controlled. If you're paying any attention to the news, and I listen to that every morning between 4.30 and 6, if you're paying any attention to the news, you know that right now, there are some new facial recognition things. Google is putting them out. So that everybody in the United States can be tracked. They're already doing this in China. 
I have a newspaper article from about six months ago where it, it talks about this facial recognition technology. And China added something like four million extra cameras on every street throughout one of their provinces. There was a reporter from NPR went over to check it out, made arrangements with the government there. He, they said, okay, we're gonna let you go out on the street and you, you leave your hotel whenever you want and at such and such a time we'll turn on the cameras and we will find you within three minutes. So he thought, okay, so he went to his hotel and then got up at his own time when he decided he was gonna go, left the hotel. So they knew when he was leaving the hotel. He walked out, they didn't have any of the cameras on him at that point. So he went different ways and up and down and all over the place. They turned on the cameras within three minutes and he was reporting. Oh, I think there's some guys trailing me. I see some guys up ahead that are coming toward me. Within three minutes, those guys had grabbed him and arrested him. And then he explained to them and they called in and yes, this was a test. They found him by facial recognition on the cameras. They could simply take a picture of his face. Say, well, yeah, but he was an American and they all look Chinese and he didn't look Chinese. Okay, they can find Chinese that way too. Everybody says, that's wonderful. Well, we can catch criminals this way. Yes, and they can also track you down too. That day is coming, folks. And it's coming to a community near you. Never before in the history of the world can the Antichrist have such control. But that day is coming. The technology is available today. But you know there's a God in heaven who will judge the earth during the great tribulation before the second coming of Christ. And praise God that the rapture is going to happen before the great tribulation gets started. Did you know that we are quickly approaching the 62nd anniversary of our national motto, In God We Trust? I bet most of you don't even remember when that became our national motto. Now, I wouldn't expect the younger ones to know, but I would hope that you older ones would know when that became our national motto. That motto became the official national motto of the United States when it was established by law passed by the 84th Congress, it was Public Law 84140, and signed by, now I know you recognize this name, I hope you do, President Dwight D. Eisenhower on July 30th, 1956. That's when it officially became the motto of the United States. But that motto has, in reality, been a part of the United States since the original settlers landed on our shores and established the constitutional republic that we enjoy today. Think about the beginnings. Let me draw your attention to just seven things where this is clearly the case. One, the Virginia Charter for the first permanent English settlement in Jamestown, 1607. That was four years before the translation of the King James Bible. Number two, the Mayflower Compact with the Plymouth Pilgrims, 1620. The Fundamental Orders of Connecticut, 1639. America's first constitution was based on a sermon. Number five, Massachusetts Body of Liberties in 1641. Number six, the New England Confederation of the Puritans in 1643. Number seven, and this is a general broad one, the, the tenor of every charter, covenant, and constitution of our founders gave an acknowledgement of our total dependence on God Almighty. Even if it didn't use those words, in God we trust, every one of them talked about our dependence on Almighty God. That's in God we trust. Dwight Eisenhower signed the national motto law in 1956, but the phrase in God we trust dates back much farther than that. According to historian Dr. Thomas Kidd, the first time the actual words in God we trust were used in an official capacity was on a regimental banner for Benjamin Franklin's volunteer Pennsylvania militia in 1776 through 1748, uh, 1747 through 1748. The Declaration of Independence is brazenly and openly a declaration of dependence on Almighty God. 
Read it carefully. I hope you read it at least once a year so that at least you'll know where your freedom lies. But listen to these four open, public, and pointed references to God and dependence on Him in the Declaration. Number one, the laws of nature and nature's God. Number two, all men are created equal and they are endowed by their Creator with certain unalienable rights. Number three, appealing to the supreme judge of the world for the rectitude of our intentions. Number four, with firm reliance on the protection of divine providence. And people want to say that our founders didn't believe in God. Did you know that the Second Continental Congress and their successors also made no less than 15 proclamations calling for, fa uh, for prayers of thanksgiving and on the other hand calling for prayers of repentance and fasting during the eight war years? Did you know that two years before President Eisenhower signed our national motto into law that a special congressional prayer room was added to the Capitol in 1954 with a kneeling bench, an altar, and an open Bible? You don't hear the pagans talking about that. Did you know that it contains a stained glass window showing George Washington kneeling in prayer with the words of Psalm 16.1? Preserve me, O God. Now listen. For in thee do I put my trust. The title of this message is Eternal Memorials. We all want to be remembered, but what is the most important eternal memorial? God has given to us His name as an eternal memorial. His name is what He wants us to remember. His name represents all that He is in His covenant relationship with us. It is his name upon which we call in our times of distress. God wants us to remember his name. God said unto Moses, Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, The Lord God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob has sent me unto you. This is my name forever, and this is my memorial unto all, all, all generations. That includes us, folks. You know, it's really kind of an insult when you don't remember somebody's name, especially after you've met them multiple times, had multiple interactions with them, have received benefits from them over and over, and had them frequently speak to you with wise counsel. How often has God done these things for us, and yet the way we live as though we have forgotten his name? When we call upon the name of the eternal God, we find salvation, refuge, strength, victory. That's why our founding fathers who had a deep knowledge of Scripture called upon the name of God. The Bible tells us the name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous runneth into it and is safe. Proverbs 18.10 Did you know that the phrase the name of the Lord occurs 108 times in the Bible? When you read those passages, you see that the word Lord is written in all capital letters. That means the passage is translating the name Yahweh or Jehovah. That's the covenant name that God gave to Moses in Exodus 3.15, which is our text for today. With that many references in the Bible, references to the name of the Lord in both Old Testament and New Testament, do you think that God meant it when he said, this is my name forever, and this is my memorial unto all generations. He says it 108 times in Old and New Testaments. I can't read you all those passages. Our time is essentially up. We've only got about five more minutes to go. But let me just give you a sample. Look at all the things connected to the name of the Lord. It goes all the way back to Genesis chapter 4. And to Seth, to him also there was born a son, and he called his name Enos. Then began men to call upon the name of the Lord. Takes you back to the very beginnings. 
Genesis chapter 12 with Abraham. And he removed from thence unto a mountain on the east of Bethel and pitched his tent having Bethel on the west and Ha'ai on the east. And there he built an altar unto the Lord Yahweh and called upon the name of the Lord. Chapter 13, unto a place of the altar which he had made there at first, and there Abraham called on the name of the Lord. Chapter 21, Abraham planted a grove in Beersheba and called there on the name of the Lord, the everlasting God. Chapter 26, and he built an altar there and called on the name of the Lord and pitched his tent there, and Isaac's servants digged a well. And I'm sure you know the next one because it's out of Exodus 20. It's where we get the Ten Commandments. Exodus 20, Deuteronomy chapter 5 is where we get those. Exodus chapter 20, verse 7. What does God think about his name? Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. God cuts a covenant with Abraham. God cuts a covenant with Moses. What happened when God cut that covenant with Moses? In Exodus 33, and he said, I will make all good my goodness pass before thee. Remember, Abraham's hiding in the cleft of the rock, and God is going to pass by him. I will make all my goodness pass before thee, and I will claim the name of the Lord before thee, and will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. And God covers him with his hand in the cleft of the rock. Reveals only his hand apart as he goes past the glory of the Lord is connected to the name of the Lord. And the Lord descended in the cloud and stood there with him and proclaimed the name of the Lord. Oh, I wish I could read you more. There are many, many. In the Psalms, we find dozens of them in the Psalms. I will praise the Lord according to the righteousness. I will sing praise to the name of the Lord Most High. Some trust in chariots, some in horses, but we remember the name of the Lord our God. So the heathen shall fear the name of the Lord and all the kings of the earth thy glory. I could read them, dozens of them that I have here. We find it in Isaiah. We find it in Jeremiah. We find it in Joel. We find it in Micah. find it in Zephaniah. For I will turn the people to a pure language, talking about the millennium, that they may call upon the name of the Lord to serve him with one consent. And so for us today, what is the powerful, invincible name of the Lord on whom we call? The New Testament makes it clear. Philippians chapter 2, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Now listen to verses 9 and 10. Wherefore, God hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. The name above every other name is the name of Jesus. I have many passages in the New Testament that where we find the name of the Lord uh, used where they're quoting Old Testament passages used over and over and over again. For example, the triumphal entry. And the multitudes that went before and followed cried, saying, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. That's the name to be remembered. That's the name of Jesus. We find it over in the book of Acts. Acts 2.21, it shall come to pass, quoting the book of Joel, that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And what name did they say they must call? The name of Jesus. 
It's also reflected in the book of Acts, the epistles where the name of the Lord is the name of Jesus. The name of Jesus is the eternal memorial that God has given to us. It is the greatest name of all. He is our Lord. He is our covenant God. He is our eternal memorial whom we call to mind every time we partake of the Lord's table, which we will do next Sunday. It's the name we call on every time we pray. Every time that we give thanks or praise or in distress, it's the name of Jesus before which we will all bow throughout all of eternity. Indeed, that is an eternal memorial. It is in his name that we have salvation and healing and forgiveness and future prophetic fulfillment. 1 Corinthians 1-2, under the church of God which is at Corinth, to them that are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints, with all that in every place call upon the name of Jesus Christ our Lord. Romans 10, 13, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Oh my, there are so many of them that we could read. I've skipped over many. Take your concordance. Look up that phrase, the name of the Lord. You know, over in the school building is a memorial flag. It's beautifully encased in a hardwood display that's covered with glass. It has two stars. There's a gold one on top, there's a blue one down at the bottom. They're about a foot across, each one. Under the gold star is the number six. Under the blue star is the number 213. Those stars represent the men from this church who served our country in World War II. Six under the gold star. Six of those men died in combat so that you could live in freedom today. Six men from this church we remember them today with honor we remember them with thanksgiving we remember them for their courage and valor we remember them for their sacrifice now hold on I suspect that not one person in this church today or listening over the internet can remember the names of all six men from this church who died for our freedom. There was actually a book published by this church. I've got a copy of it. Showing the pictures and the names and the ranks of each of those six men. Do you remember even one of them? There is, however, one name that we must remember. The one name that is an eternal memorial. It is the name of the covenant God of Israel. It is the name of our Lord and Savior. It is the name Jesus. That is God's eternal memorial that he has given for every generation. And that is the name that is given for our salvation. Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Amen. Our gracious Heavenly Father, how we thank you for the name of Jesus. How we thank you that you've given us your name as an eternal memorial. The names of all the pagan gods have faded into oblivion. They're hardly remembered at all except by archaeologists who happen to dig them up. But the name of the Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ, the one who is our sovereign God, the one who is our Savior, the one who is our Redeemer, the one who bought us with his own blood, the one who paid the penalty for our sins, the 
the one in whom we have forgiveness and redemption, propitiation, reconciliation, atonement. The one who is our all in all. His name we never forget. The name Jesus. We thank you, Father. And we can only thank you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Our closing hymn for today. If I can find my bulletin.